Galaxies and cosmology used to be one program, but it got to be where it included so many new and interesting things about both of them that we had to split it up into two parts in order to make it manageable. Uh, however, since they are still intertwined, so to speak, uh, we do have to have a little bit of overlap. So some of the things you'll see tonight kind of maybe jump the gun a little bit into cosmology, and then next time we have to have a little bit about galaxies in order to do the cosmology. So I apologize for that, but it's better than an hour and a half long session. Okay, in the beginning, and the connotations of that are quite obvious, and uh, we'll hit more on that next month. After the, uh, a lot of things you'll sort of have to take on faith, either religious or scientific, uh, for this evening, we'll just present a few of the uh, scientific observations, and we'll go more into the in depth on the origin of the universe uh, next time. But we'll say that the beginning of the universe was the Big Bang, the event that gave rise to the universe, and there was probably only energy at the very beginning, primarily in the form of gamma rays, the shortest wavelength and highest energy form of energy in the whole electromagnetic spectrum much, much more energetic than visible light or radio waves or ultraviolet or even x-ray. Uh, but all of those were present as well, but no matter probably at the very beginning, just various types of photons or light, if you prefer, since we kind of refer to all of them as light. After a few seconds, Einstein's equation E equals mc squared started to work in reverse. We all know that if we convert matter into energy, that that equation applies. But it also applies for energy being converted into matter. If you have enough energy, matter can form from it. So we used to say matter was constant and energy was constant, but now the total together, mass energy is considered the constant rather than just one or the other because they are interconvertible. Uh, probably the Almost all of the first elements form were helium. We've got a periodic table behind this screen, but you can't see it. But you know that hydrogen is in the number one position. Deuterium is just a form of hydrogen with an extra neutron in the nucleus instead of just a proton. And uh, probably uh, some helium, element number two, two protons, two neutrons. After a few more minutes, elements three and four were probably formed in very small amounts from the original energy of the Big Bang going backwards from energy into matter. Then, nothing more in the way of elements was formed until much, much later after the first new stars that were formed started making elements inside. We saw what happens inside a star last month in the uh, Stellar Evolution Program that hydrogen is converted into helium and then helium is converted into carbon and other heavy elements up to iron in the cores of uh, stars like the sun or larger ones. Elements are all made up through iron. And then we saw that when the very biggest stars, the blue giants that turn into red supergiants and then explode as type two supernovae, that creates all the rest of the elements in the periodic table at once in a few seconds and blows them out through the universe where they're recycled and formed into new stars with planets like the Earth with inhabitants like us. So that's kind of the short version of uh, where our material uh, beings came from is we're all essentially stardust from after millions of years after the Big Bang, after one or two or maybe three generations of stars had formed and exploded, then there was enough solid matter to form the rest of the uh, planets. You know, if we, just, if we were all made of hydrogen, that, we couldn't get very far. We'd have to have other elements around in order to function and to have something to stand on. Okay, moving on now to what's happened to all these blobs of matter, mostly hydrogen, that were formed in the Big Bang. Uh, a big enough blob of matter, hydrogen, we can start calling a proto-galaxy because eventually each big blob would become a galaxy. And these proto-galaxies 
have three variable parameters. We saw that stars had a couple when a new star cluster was being formed. The individual stars within it had different amounts of mass, and that determined their brightness and where they were on the main sequence diagram and how long they would live. The whole thing was determined by how much matter went into it. And we also saw previously that when stars have rotation or angular momentum, that determines their whole planetary situation. A little blob of gas that's within a, a, a new star cluster that's going to become a new star, if it has no angular momentum at all, all the material just falls into the center and becomes a single star. We now think that's a very unusual occurrence. Most of the time, there's turbulence, angular momentum. If there's a whole lot of that, then the, uh, the little blob of gas breaks up into several pieces, and we have a multiple star system. And it appears now that about two-thirds of all the stars are multiple rather than single stars. And if somewhere in between, like Goldilocks, is just right, if you have some angular momentum but not enough to break it up into several stars, you'll have most of it falling into the middle to become a star, and the rest of it forms a disk around that star that condenses to form planets. And we saw pictures of that actually happening, and those are online for your edification. Galaxies forming have a lot of similarities. The galaxies have various amounts of mass and angular momentum and turbulence. Those are the things that distinguish one proto-galaxy from another. The ones that have the least angular momentum, the matter within each one falls into the center and becomes the nucleus of that galaxy. Similar to the formation of the solar system, the matter in the, that formed the solar system that didn't have much spin to it fell into the center and became the sun. The part that did have a lot of spin uh, flattened out into the disk that became the planet here in the formation of galaxies. That becomes the spiral arms of a galaxy. So we have the rather inert material falls into the center due to gravity, becomes the nucleus of the galaxy. The rest that's got a lot of angular momentum spins around and forms a disk. If they... Uh, some, and then there's in between, once again. Things that are in between uh, the zero angular momentum that falls into the center and lots that forms the spiral arms, those with intermediate amounts of angular momentum kind of go into orbit around the center every which way and form the, what we now have is globular clusters of stars around the center of our galaxy. So our galaxy and many others are surrounded by a swarm of these globular clusters containing 100,000 to a half a million stars, not in the plane, not in the center, but kind of like a swarm of bees orbiting around the center in a halo. We'll see a picture of that shortly. And the material that wasn't used up was left behind to form a halo around the galaxy, a galactic halo. Okay, I've been pointing out these parallels, but I like to do that often, so here they are again. The nucleus of the galaxy is like the sun in the solar system, formation process, the same. The disk that eventually formed the planets is analogous to the disk that forms the spiral arms of the galaxy. And the globular clusters are like the comets that orbit around the solar system, not in the plane of it, but every which way, just like the globular clusters do around the center of our galaxy. And finally, the halo of the galaxy is like the Oort cloud, the spherical cloud that is at the far limits of our solar system where it's thought that comets and maybe small planets come from, Kuiper belt objects, things like that. The debris sort of that's left over out on the far fringes is the analogous to the halo of the galaxy. So it's like once the plan was worked out, it was done on the big scale and then the small scale. Here's a picture from the formation of the solar system with the material falling into the center to become the sun. And remember, when anything falls into the center, there's always an outflow of matter and energy at right angles to it, perpendicular to the disk. And then here the 
uh, rings separating out that eventually condensed in the planet. And here's one planetesimal here that's going to become a planet that kind of got ahead of the rest of them in there. So this picture tries to show all the history of the formation of the solar system in one picture. Here it is with our galaxy. Edge on view, here's the center of our Milky Way galaxy. We're out here near the edge, about a third of the way in. This is about 100,000 light years across here instead of a few astronomical units for the solar system. But, uh, and then here's the halo of globular clusters around it and then the uh, halo of the galaxy. We won't go into the corona out here. That's kind of hypothetical anyhow. But that's uh, analogous to the solar system with the, the sun and the disk that form the planets and the comets around it. Same deal again with the formation of the galaxy. Okay, most of the galaxies were formed in the same general way and at about the same time, just gradually as the, uh, after the beginning of the universe. But they don't all look the same, just like all stars don't look the same. Their initial properties determine how they turn out. In the case of the stars, that was the mass mainly, but also angular momentum as to whether they have planets or not. But in galaxies, uh, there are all kinds of galaxies. You look at a picture from the Hubble, they're all different sizes, shapes, uh, structures, and all of that has to do with their initial properties. It's, nobody messes with it once they get started. You know, it, once it's uh, on its way, it's all in the cards from the very beginning. Edwin Hubble, I'm sure you've heard of, it's only from the telescope named in his honor. He proposed that galaxies evolved along a tuning fork diagram. He laid out all the different kinds of structures and looked sort of like this. Here are different types of galaxies, elliptical ones of different sizes and shapes, then spiral galaxies, and you can see the tightly wound arms more loosely and then uh, very loosely wound. And then the same thing down here, but with a bar through the middle, kind of like a handlebar of streamers coming off of it. So those are the classifications of galaxies. And he proposed, and others counter-proposed, that galaxies started out this way and then eventually took one of those paths and wound up like this. Others said, no, they start out like this or this and evolve this way and gradually wind up like that. Does that remind you of anything that we had last month? Remember the main sequence on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram where all the stars are laid out from upper left to lower right? Do they start out as blue giants and wind up as red dwarfs or vice versa? No, they, they stay the same all throughout their main lives depending on their mass and that determines their luminosity, their brightness, their color. That's the way they are. They don't evolve from one type to another. As we now know, galaxies appear not to evolve from one type to another, but their shape, structure, classification, all depends on their initial property. So this is just a reminder that great astronomers make great discoveries, predictions, and they nearly always, like all scientists, go one step too far and screw up. And then somebody else has to come along and build on what they did and then do it right from then on. So uh, Hubble was incorrect about the, which way the galaxies evolved on the tuning fork diagram, because they don't. Okay, the galaxies have different amounts of matter in the proto-galaxy. And angular momentum was different in turbulence. So that's what makes the different galaxies that we see, the different types. And I've already set up that analogy about the stars forming and the, whether uh, the star will have uh, be a single star, multiple star, or one with planets. We've already seen that kind of analogy. Now let's see how it affects galaxies. Galaxies that have mostly low angular momentum matter. That is, it's not swirling and churning very much. After the Big Bang and the proto-galaxies were flying apart from each other, some of them had a lot of turbulence in them. Some of them were relatively stationary other than their overall motion. It's just kind of the luck of the draw as to how much angular momentum wound up in each one. <clears throat> 
these galaxies, most of the material would fall into the center, sort of like the sun forming in the solar system. And when that much matter falls into the, any one place, gravity compresses it <clears throat> until it becomes a black hole. Now, this is not exactly the same kind of black hole we were talking about last month when a supernova explodes and crushes the core of the star down to a ball of neutrons about the size of Memphis that contains maybe two or three or four solar masses. We're talking about millions of solar masses at the center of a galaxy. That's why they're called supermassive black holes. We could do a whole program just on black holes because besides the stellar type and the supermassive type at the center of galaxies, there's a third type that I'll keep secret from you until we get to that sometime way off in the future. So, and then most of the rest of the matter in those galaxies had the intermediate angular momentum and they would form into globular clusters. What does it take to form a disk? A lot of material with a lot of rotation to it. And those that didn't have much of that didn't have much of a disk, if any. So these are the elliptical galaxies and these are probably the earliest ones to get into their final form. Now the proto-galaxies, we think we're all formed at the same time, but for them to achieve their final form as an elliptical galaxy, these probably were the first ones to get everything in order because there wasn't much to do. Most of the material just fell into the middle and became supermassive black holes. The rest of it turned into the globular cluster surrounding it, and that's pretty much the end of the story. They've been that way ever since. Here's an example of one, M87 in Virgo easily visible in a small telescope. This is a giant elliptical galaxy. And what are we actually seeing here? This bright glow in the center is the nucleus of the galaxy, probably a supermassive black hole or several there, millions of solar masses. And all of this that we can see here are globular clusters. You don't see any disk there, there isn't one. There's hardly any rotation. Uh, just the motion of the globular clusters randomly oriented around the center of the galaxy. So it's a big ball of globular clusters surrounding a supermassive black hole. So that's what a giant elliptical galaxy is because it didn't have much angular momentum to start with. Okay, moderately high amounts of angular momentum. They would also have material that fell into the center and formed a nucleus, probably black hole, uh, supermassive. Milky Way almost certainly has one in the center and uh, millions of solar masses. But there, and uh, of course it would have globular clusters around it since there is a uh, amount of turbulence there that caused them to not fall into the center. But there's a lot of angular momentum component there analogous to the formation of the planets in the solar system that gave rise to the disk orbiting around the nucleus, and this is what eventually became the uh, spiral arms of a spiral galaxy. And they rotate very rapidly. Here's a typical example of one and that we see all spring and summer, early autumn in the Big Dipper, M81, a spiral galaxy, and the supermassive black hole in the center, most likely. And you don't see that, it doesn't show up in pictures, but we can tell they're there. We'll go into that some other time. And then the spiral arms coming off of that, uh, defining the plane of the disk of rotation. It's obvious just from looking at it that it's rotating, and that's uh, why it has that particular structure. This is taken with the Hubble telescope. Most of the ones I'm showing you are taken by amateurs, but this is an unusually good Hubble one. Here's a, an amateur picture here. Here's another one. We can see this in almost edge on, the Sombrero Galaxy in Virgo, M104, the, in the Messier catalog that our books help you find. The, we can see edge on, lots of gas and dust. We can see something going on there in the middle. And what's all this glow above and below? Those are the globular clusters surrounding the nucleus. So it's got uh, a disk, a center, and globular clusters and a halo around it. Okay, uh, sometimes I think there may be galaxies that have double nuclei, uh, two major supermassive black holes in the middle. And to me, that would be the best explanation for the barred spiral galaxies. 
we'll see some pictures of those, but uh, there's not a good way to explain why we would have spiral arms coming out of like an elbow out here if there weren't something kind of anchoring this spot and this spot. I'm saying that there are probably two supermassive black holes that form, kind of like a binary star does when there's just the right amount of turbulence. The nebula that forms that star breaks in two, and then you have the two stars orbiting around each other. I'm saying that when a galaxy forms that way, if it has just the right amount of angular momentum and turbulence, we can have two different uh, centers for the mass to fall into, still enough left for a disk with spiral arms, but they have this strange structure in the middle that uh, would be hard to explain in terms of one thing in the middle with elbows sticking out of it. Now, the third type is if we have a very high degree of turbulence in the proto-galaxy. We had low and medium and now high amount of turbulence. These have actually just now started getting down to the business of forming stars. With all the turbulence and churning around going on in these types of irregular galaxies, uh, you can't undergo star formation. A nebula can't condense to form a cluster of stars if it's all in a turmoil. That has to settle down first, and over the eons, some of them have. Some of them are just now getting around uh, billions of years later into forming stars. Here's one like that, M82 in Ursa Major. Remember M81 and 82? You can see them both in the same field of the telescope at low power. M81 is the nice spiral. M82 is an irregular galaxy. You don't see spiral arms. In some pictures taken in ultraviolet and x-rays, you see stuff shooting out of the top and bottom of this, kind of like the black holes in the center were still forming and stuff is shooting out at right angles to it. So uh, this is what you see right next to M81, the irregular galaxy. There's some closer to home. I don't see, let me just for a moment decrease the illumination. This is a picture I took in Australia a few years ago, 2006, we went down there. And here is the, uh, one of the, here and here are the two Magellanic clouds, the, the, our satellite galaxies of the Milky Way that surround our galaxy like a satellite. And we can only see them in the southern hemisphere, way south of the equator, they're there and there. This is just taken with a camera. We were talking about astrophotography. I just had a 50 millimeter lens plunked down on a tripod and opened it up for uh, 52 seconds and got this picture of the two Magellanic clouds. Here's a much better one taken with a real observatory. And uh, you can see the small and large clouds of Magellan. Irregular galaxies, no disk, no globular clusters, no well-defined nucleus. It's just getting started good. Okay, this used to be a big mystery, quasars. Now we know it's a, a step in the formation of galaxies. That when giant elliptical galaxies were forming, when the supermassive black holes in the center were gaining material, after the black holes were there, more material still kept falling in. Uh, there was a lot of it there, and as it fell in, it would get superheated, very, very, very hot, and send out bursts of X-rays, gamma rays, everything. And those were very mysterious. Sometimes those outbursts were way brighter than anything uh, in the sky. They were first thought to be very close. Then we realized that there were cosmic distances away sometimes billions of light years. And the, uh, there's an example of one, a quasar. Here's the nucleus of that galaxy, and here's the material shooting out from it. You can't see it very well going the other way, but it's always bipolar. Um, remember the Cygnus X1, how that worked uh, for a, a stellar black hole. Here's the picture of that. 
Here's a black hole with a red giant star nearby with its outer layers falling off, being drawn into the black hole, orbiting around and around. As it goes in, it gets so hot that it sends out uh, X-rays, and it was determined that way by an X-ray telescope, the Uhuru. So, giant elliptical galaxies, some of them are far enough away where we can see the way they were billions of years ago. In the very first installment of this short course, I pointed out that astronomy observations were like using a time machine. Even when you look at the moon, if you're seeing it as it was one and a third seconds ago, some of the planets 45 minutes, an hour and a half away, the nearby stars years ago, across our galaxy, 100,000 years, to the nearest galaxies to us millions of years ago, millions of light years away. And if we look way, 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 way back at the very extreme edges of the universe, we will see those giant elliptical galaxies when they were forming with the very bright nuclei because of the material falling into it. Those were the quasars. So they eventually fizzle out, and we'll see that uh, in just a moment. But when we are seeing quasars, we're seeing things that are so far away that we're looking back at their youth. It's sort of like you could uh, somehow look back and see a picture of me and Felix in real time from 1988, that would be kind of interesting. <laughs> okay, here's M87 again. Uh, here is the galaxy itself, and here's the jet coming out of it in the uh, gamma ray and X-ray part of the spectrum. So you can see that that stuff shooting out of the middle of it is a, a very high source of energy. Seifert galaxy. As the material falls into the center of a supermassive galaxy's black hole, like a, a quasar, eventually that material that doesn't have much angular momentum starts to get depleted. And if it has a disk around it, then it's orbiting there, or if it's all the rest of its globular clusters, they're all there. The matter is pretty much played out that was falling into the center. As it starts to taper off, it gets kicked out of the quasar category and becomes a Seifert galaxy, which it, uh, many years ago was thought to be a whole separate kind of thing. We realized that those were galaxies. Carl Seifert at Vanderbilt was the one who did the studies on that back in the 40s and early 50s. And he discovered a whole class of galaxies that had um, very, very bright nuclei. And those just turned out to be the next stage after quasars in the formation of galaxies before they settle down and look like a normal uh, galaxy minding its own business. So those are Seifert galaxies. Here's one, another one that's a Messier object, M77 and Cetus. Very unusually bright center because there's still material falling into the black hole, not bright enough to make it a quasar because it did that before, but now it's simmering down and it's still abnormally bright. Galaxies like our own Milky Way and the very small ones and the turbulent irregular ones that haven't really started star formation yet probably weren't ever quasars or even Seifert galaxies. So that seems to be reserved for the giant elliptical galaxies and some that are very, very big otherwise. Uh, otherwise, there wouldn't be that much material in the center to make a bright hole, uh, black hole that's got enough material falling into it to be seen all the way across the universe billions of years later, like a quasar, or uh, simmer down some to be a Seifert galaxy. So Milky Way probably never was in that category. Here's some pictures that I thought you might find interesting. This is false color, by the way. Galaxies don't really look like that. Here's another one. Here's another one. Anybody recognize that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a Typhoon Haiyan, or Yolanda, as it was called in the Philippines from a couple of years ago. And here is the Hurricane Sandy off the northeast coast uh, in 2012. And here is the Hurricane Fran from 96 off the coast of Florida. And certainly you can see some similarities there. And uh, like 
all things there's a reason for everything sometimes it's not obvious sometimes it is we have rotation around a low pressure area which uh, causes a column of heat to rise up that's uh, absorbed from the ocean and put into the atmosphere through the center or eye of the hurricane that causes the surrounding air with a lot of moisture in it to be attracted in towards the center sort of like gravity in the formation of a galaxy but it's not gravity it's just uh, the suction from the column of air rising in the center and as it gets closer and closer it rotates faster and faster leaving behind the spiral arms of the hurricane so there's a, a lot of parallels that you can go the more different areas you know something about the more you see they're not really all that different everything seems to be related somehow in 71 years one thing i've learned is it there's only about four or five things and everything else is just a special case of that so <laughs> <clears throat> okay, a <laughs> little bit of terminology here. The elliptical galaxies, as we saw, had their star formation first because they had the least amount of turbulence. And those contain what we call population two stars. Now, why would we call those population two if they were the first ones to form? Well, that's just another mistake, kind of like the main sequence and the tuning fork diagram and any number of things if we had it to do over we'd probably do it differently but we're stuck with that terminology the oldest stars are the population two stars so they're the ones near the center of a galaxy and the ones in the globular clusters which just formed right after the galaxy got going very little gas left inside of those the irregular galaxies the ones are highly turbulent no new star formation just now getting underway and again just right the uh well, whoops i've got uh, barred spirals there this is an alternative hypothesis about barred spirals i suggested that they form that way in the beginning from uh, the proto galaxy breaking up into two parts orbiting around each other for two supermassive black holes uh, i think more astronomers think that they're due to the merger of two galaxies. However, about two-thirds of all spiral galaxies are barred spirals, and you kind of have to ask yourself with the millions of light years in between them, what's the chances of that many of them having run into each other and merged? So I think they were formed that way from the beginning, but uh, you can do a computer simulation that proves that they're, that they're due to galaxies merging. Keep in mind that you can do a computer simulation that proves anything as long as you know how it's supposed to turn out at the end. <laughs> See, this is an actual photograph of some merged galaxies. Here's the computer simulation showing you just how that happened. <laughs> so take that for what it's worth. Okay, the spiral galaxies contain old stars that were formed near the beginning and the ones in the globular cluster. We still call those population two and the disk appears to have a spiral structure and we'll see in a moment that that's probably an illusion but it's probably due to gravity waves from an asymmetric nucleus the it may be two black holes close together near the center or it may have uh, to do with shock waves from supernovae <coughs> somehow trigger the formation of new stars and what looks like a curved pattern radiating out from the nucleus we see that kind of structure in Saturn's rings with uh, little spikes and spokes going out through there, but they get a curvature to them due to the uh, subsequent rotation. Um, and the population, we call these new stars, population one. And they act as markers for the, where the new stars are forming, which makes it look like it has curved spiral arms coming out of it. And those are population one. How do you tell, how do you remember Population one is the new ones, or, and population two is the old ones. Well, the way I see it is one is like the sun, it rhymes. The sun is a population one star out in the uh, spiral arms of the galaxy. Two has got the sound of nucleus in it. So the ones in the nucleus and globular clusters are two. The sun is one in the spiral arms. Now that's, that's how I... 
remember it. Because if you get logical on it, you come up with the wrong answer. Okay. Stars tend to be brighter and bluer than the old population two stars. Now, I like analogies. Here's one about the spiral arm. Suppose you had a big field and you planted seeds all over it uniformly. We're saying here that the uh, spiral galaxy disk is probably uniform in density of the hydrogen and the other elements all over. It doesn't have arms, really. It's like a disk, like a phonograph record. Remember those? So the, think of this as like a big circular field that you've uniformly planted seeds all over it. Then suppose you go out with a sprinkler of some kind and water here and here and here and here and you wait a few days and then you see little green curved arms coming up from the ground like spiral arms of a galaxy. Even though you planted the seeds uniformly, you did something that triggered their development that wasn't uniform. So if the galaxy itself was sitting there with a uniform disk circling around and something like asymmetric gravity waves from a nucleus or supernova explosions or some combination of that sent out straight lines, then the galaxy itself rotating would cause them to curve and it would look like you've got a structure there where it's really just a, a, an area of activity in that constant background structure. Remember uh, this from last time? the different populations of stars. Here's the uh, relatively new uh, star cluster, the double cluster in Perseus. We have blue giants up here, red dwarfs are down there, red giants, super giants over in, in this corner. An older cluster, these stars have all left. Uh, we talked about that last time, that the more mass and more brilliant a star is, uh, the shorter its life. It burns it up quickly and blows up or does something interesting towards the end. The, uh, as the stars peel off of the main sequence, eventually all you have left is solar type stars here on down to red dwarf. So you, you can tell how old a cluster is by looking at it. Here's one for a typical globular cluster, M55 in Sagittarius. Nearly all of us have seen that in the summer sky, a very beautiful one. Uh, notice that it's very old. This is a population two stars, the globular clusters and the halo around the galaxy. It has mainly stars from the solar type on down to the bottom. Here's the color-coded one. Here's where the solar type stars are here. Luminosity compared to the sun of one, which you'd expect, on down into the red dwarf. That's why the globular clusters generally look kind of orangish color as opposed to blue like the spiral arms of a galaxy. Notice there are a few blue giants still up here in this globular cluster. What in the world are they doing there since they only last 100,000 years and the cluster is probably uh, several billion, many billions of years old? Well, they used to be called blue stragglers, like they had some kind of arrested development. And for some reason, they stayed as blue giants for way longer than they were supposed to. Then... Uh, got some ideas as to they were much better, and that was from the merger of smaller stars. In a globular cluster, the stars are uh, near the center, less than a light year apart, out near the edges, several light years apart. There are frequent collisions in there, and if two small stars bump together, it makes a bigger one that's up farther on the HR diagram, and bluer and hotter and brighter. So these are not blue stragglers, but brand new merged stars that uh, uh, are not held over from the beginning, but are kind of getting a new lease on life by pooling their resources and going up to here. That's why you sometimes see supernova explosions in a globular cluster where they should all be done by now. So those are the, that's the story on the blue stragglers. Okay, you look at color pictures of galaxies, they always look reddish towards the center, orange, and blue out in the spiral arm. Here's our near neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, two and a half million light years away. And we can see the population two stars near the middle towards the nucleus, and then the nice blue uh, solar type stars and blue giants, new stars forming all the time out in the outer reaches of the galaxy. 
Notice it has two satellite galaxies also, kind of like our Magellanic Cloud. Okay, evolution of galaxies. We saw they didn't move along the uh, tuning fork diagram, but they do change some. So we have to figure out how the uh, galaxy structure is, uh, is done. We now can do that with radio telescopes. We can look through all the dust and gas in the galaxies that we normally uh, can't see through with optical telescopes. Radio telescopes can see a 21 centimeter line of radiation. So what's 21 centimeters? About eight and a quarter inches compared to the nanometer size of optical light that gets scattered by gas and dust. This goes right on through so we can see it. Where does that come from? It's a thing that hydrogen atoms can do. A hydrogen atom consists of a proton and an electron. If they both have the same spin, the same direction of spin, that's their high energy state. If the electron flips over and then goes the other direction, that's a lower energy state. And whenever anything goes from a high energy state to a lower energy state, energy is given off. And that energy is the 21 centimeter or eight and a quarter inch wavelength that comes out when that occurs. So that's where that energy comes from. We also have absorption lines. If we have all kinds of radiation going through a patch of hydrogen and the atom is in its low state with the spins being opposite, it can kick that electron back to the high energy state again going the same direction like it was up here. When it does that, the 21 centimeter line is taken out and that energy went into flipping the electron. So we can see a missing arrow over here that would be a dark line in the radio spectrum. So we can see either emission or absorption at 21 centimeters from hydrogen. Well, what's the point of that? Well, the galaxy structure is made of hydrogen primarily, and where the new stars are forming and living and blowing up, there's a lot of active hydrogen, and a lot of this process is going on. So if we can see that with radio telescopes, we can get an estimate of how the spiral arms look in our galaxy. Even if the spiral arms aren't real, the uh, structure looks like it's there because of the activity, and we can see how that uh, is going on. And the Doppler effect that we talked about before, if the arm is moving towards us, the 21 centimeter may be shortened a little bit, and if it's receding from us, the 21 centimeter may be stretched a little bit. That lets us tell whether we're looking at a part of the galaxy that's moving towards us or away from us. And with that, we have mapped out a tentative structure of the Milky Way galaxy from our position in what we call the Orion arm, about a third of the way in from the edge. We can get a fairly decent idea of what the rest of it looks like. This is all subject to change without notice as technology improves. But uh, we've got some idea of what our galaxy looks like. We can't take a picture of it like we can of M81, but uh, it's like being locked in your house. If you look at, out the window to other houses, you get an idea of what a house looks like. And if you look around inside your house, you can kind of see what it must look like from the outside, and that's the best we're able to do with that. Okay, um, recycling. We talked about that last time. In the spiral galaxies, that's where new stars are forming, blue giants that only live 100 million years and blow up and make new elements and all of that, civilizations can only occur where that's happening. If you had an elliptical galaxy that's had only hydrogen in its stars from the very beginning and nothing interesting going on in it, no new star formation, uh, you're not going to find any civilizations there. So if one of your hobbies is to use a radio telescope or some other device to search for intelligent signals coming from elsewhere, you can skip the elliptical galaxies, the irregular galaxies, because things haven't even gotten started good yet there, and concentrate on the spiral galaxies, because the only civilization we know of is in a spiral galaxy, and that's us. So that's a clue that maybe that's a good place to look. And this is a good place to stop. So I <laughs> uh, thank you all for your attention. If you have any questions. <laughs> okay. Okay.